Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Royal City Community Church. We're so glad that you could join us today on this 17th of May. Praise the Lord. We thank you for just uh, joining and tuning in. I trust that you're learning something from as we've been going through this book of Galatians. Uh, we're going to continue in chapter 3 today. Hopefully get into the Abrahamic covenant, but we'll see how it goes. But let's just open up with a word of prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord God, we rejoice in you today. We thank you for bringing us together, Lord God, in your presence. Lord, just continue to thank you for the anointing power of your Holy Spirit. Continue to fall in each of our homes and each of our lives, Father God. And Lord, we thank you that you've redeemed us from the curse. And we can rejoice in that, Father God. We thank you that poverty, sickness, and and death, which is spiritual death, Father God, has no hold on us, Lord God. We thank you that you have given us the victory, and it belongs to us through Christ Jesus. So, Father God, I thank you as we look into your word today. Holy Spirit, we thank you for what you're going to reveal to each one. We give you praise, glory, and honor for that now. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, you can turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 3. We're going to be reading verses 11 and 12, but we're going to do a little bit of a review before we get to that this morning. Uh, you remember last week we had looked at verse 10, or actually verses 9 and 10, but verse 10 stated that those who are subject to the law are under a curse, because cursed is everyone that continues not in all the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. That's uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. And we noted that no one is able to keep every point of the law. So the law is not only not only makes us, us slaves to a system of do's and don'ts, it actually condemns us because we are not able to live up to that system. The law thus becomes our condemnation rather than our deliverance. That's why we said that the law was never given by God as a means of salvation, but only to cause man to realize his inability to save himself. He can then turn to God to receive the free gift of salvation that's been bought and paid for by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? Now, once that salvation has been received by grace through faith, we as believers then sometimes make the mistake of trying to please God by works of righteousness. And we read, you know, we can read our Bibles, we can pray, we can, we can fast, uh, we can witness to others about Christ, we can attend church. Uh, we can pay our tithes, we can give offerings, we can do those good works, and, and on and on and on. All of that is, is good and well. Amen? All of that is good and well, but the mistake that we make is doing all those things and thinking that by doing them, we, we are attaining or retaining righteousness because we're pleasing God. And the truth is, the Word of God has made it clear that faith is what pleases God. Amen? It is faith that pleases God, not works of the law. So I see, and if it was not works that saved us, it naturally follows that it is not works that makes us spiritual. On the contrary, many times our works, our own self-effort, uh, prevent us from fulfilling righteousness because they get our eyes off the source of our righteousness and focus them on ourselves. So I hope you've had enough time to get to Galatians chapter 3. We're going to look at verse 11. As I said, that was just a little bit of a review from last week. But verse 11 says of Galatians 3, But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Now this carries on, in verse 11, carries on the same idea that Paul has pointed out, that no one is justified, no one is made righteous by the law, but by faith. We're saved by faith to live a life of faith, amen? So to begin our Christianity, or, or pardon me, to live our Christian life by faith, and then attempt to live it by works is to fall back into legalism. A person cannot remain righteous by works any more than he, than he could become righteous by works. Now the Christian life is one of faith from beginning to end. And the Bible tells us that the just, those who are saved by faith, shall live by faith. Amen. So why then do we work? We don't, we don't work to get the Lord's favor. He was pleased with us before he saved us. I mean, that's what grace is. Grace is God's favor. It was by his favor that we were saved in the first place. So we cannot now retain his favor by works any more than we received his favor by working for it. No, we work for God because we love him. Amen? And we're thankful and grateful to him for his wonderful works on our behalf. We don't work to please God. 
Rather, our works are evidence that he is already pleased with us. Okay, so now you should remember this. Uh, if you were here, I probably ask if you remember uh, this was a little bit of a, a, an exam, a little test. But can you tell me what the twofold theme of the book of Galatians is? Because it's been brought out again and again and again as we've as gone through this study. If you don't remember, here's the reminder. Okay, number one, justification by faith. And number two, spirituality by faith. That is the theme that, what, that runs basically throughout the entire book of Galatians. Uh, look at the second, sorry, pardon me, the first half of uh, verse uh, 11 again. No man is justified by the law in the sight of God. So works do not justify a person in the sight of God. They may justify him in the sight of man, but not in God's eyes. But doesn't James say that Abraham was justified by works? Well, he does. In James chapter 2, verse 21, it says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he'd offered Isaac his son upon the altar? See, that action was a work. But Abraham's work did not justify him before God. It justified him before man. You see, men needed to know that Abraham believed and that God accounted that belief unto him as righteousness. The same is true in our lives as well. People need to see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven, just as Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. But our Lord did not say to the our Lord did not say that they were saved by their good works. Then if we're not saved by good works, what then is the purpose? Well, the purpose of works is not our salvation. Okay? It is the salvation of others. I hope you caught that. I'll say it again. The purpose of works is not our salvation, it's the salvation of others. You say, well, what do you mean by that? Simply this, the world cannot see on the inside of us as Christians, okay? They don't see what's going on in the inside here, okay? To them, obviously, we are just, you know, we're human beings, just like they are. And judging by our outward appearance, we may seem to be, you know, no different than they are. But God, what does he do? He looks on the heart. And he sees faith, that he sees the faith that's in there. And that faith, as we've said, pleases him. So we don't need to prove our faith to God for him to save us, amen? But other people need to see some outward manifestation of that faith if they are going to be convinced that we have anything that they don't have. Okay, I trust you followed that, amen? The world can't see our faith, okay? It can only see the results of our faith, which is the good works. The works then, like tongues are not a sign for the believer, but for the unbeliever. 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 14, verse 22. So our good works are not the means by which we win points with God. Okay? They're not the means that we win points with God. They are the means by which we win souls for God. Hallelujah. I mean, do you think God is more interested in our winning points or in our being like Jesus? Don't you think he's more interested in our being anointed of the Holy Ghost and with power and going about doing good and healing all who are oppressed of the devil? Come on, hallelujah, because God is with us. I mean, that's Acts chapter 10, verse 38. Which of these two do you think is more pleasing to God? Which of these two do you think will have the most positive effect on unbelievers? Now look at the, uh, the second half of verse 11. For the just shall live by faith. And that's a quote from Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4, which basically says, the just shall live by his faith. I mean, are, ask you a question, are you just? Are you just? And if so, how did you become just? Well, you became just by faith, amen? How do you live now that you are just? Again, by faith. So faith gets a person into the kingdom of God. And faith keeps him going once he's in, amen? We don't start by faith. And then turn to the law any more than we start with the law and stay with the law. No, we started by faith and we will stay with faith. We who are just live by our faith. Amen? Okay, verse 12. Looking at verse 12. It says, that, that yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Now this verse is a quote from Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 5. And, and it's part of the law given by God uh, through Moses to the children of Israel. Uh, this verse points out that if we just shrug off faith and true spirituality to try to attain righteousness 
by our own self-effort, then we are obliged to live our whole life by the law. See, once we begin to abide by the law, then we are obligated to abide in the law. Deuteronomy 28 warns that anyone who does not continue in the law brings the curse of the law upon themselves. So it's not easy to continue in the law. Because to break one part of it is to break all of it. See, now when we, as Gentiles, we talk about the law, we usually think of typically just the Ten Commandments. But that wasn't the whole of the Jewish law. The law is the whole of the first five books of the Bible. Yeah, and I think, I, I don't have a count of this, but I'm, I think it's somewhere around over 615, 620 separate commandments that are contained within those five books. So let's just say for argument's sake, there, there's 620 laws that are contained in the first five books of the Bible. And you can keep 619 of them. But if you miss that one, if you miss that one, to offend in one is to offend in all. That's what the law did. Okay, So anyone who thinks he can attain righteousness by keeping the law, you got your work cut out for you. I mean, that's, that's all I can say. I mean, it's impossible to keep every jot and every tittle of the law. And that's why one reason the Bible teaches that, teaches that by works of the law is no flesh justified. No flesh is perfect enough to keep the law for their entire lifetime. I mean, it's just, it's just it's impossible, okay? I mean, you can, to try to do that for your entire lifetime without breaking it in some way, even one little minor thing, it, it, is, it is virtually impossible. To break the law is to call down the curse upon the offender. That curse is still there, interestingly enough. That curse is still there. That curse is still active. That curse is still operative. That's why we Christians can't just live any old way we want to and still prosper in every facet of our lives. Now, it's true that we're no longer under the, the old covenant, okay? We're no longer under the law. We're under the new covenant. But, there, but that does not mean that we are lawless. Hope you grasped that this morning. Our Lord removed us from the curse of the law so the blessing of Abraham could come upon us. But if we consciously remove ourselves from his circle of protection by committing sin, then the curse can still come back upon us unless that sin is removed. I say, well, if no one could keep the law, how in the world did the people in the Old Testament become justified? What happened when they kept breaking the law over and over again? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. See, because what happened, and you, you look back at the, the sacrifices that, and, and, the, and the, uh, the blood sacrifices that they continually made over and over and over again, those sacrifices, they didn't save them. Okay? They just pointed to the one who could save them, to the Messiah. Animal sacrifices were simply a means of teaching the people about the future Christ, who would one day come to die to offer himself as the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world permanently. Okay, so the blood shed on the Old Testament altars was then a type of the atoning blood of Jesus Christ, which, which, alone, which alone has the power to wash away sin and cleanse unrighteousness. See, in the Old Testament saints, they were cleansed of sin the same way you and I are. By the shedding of blood, uh, Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22 tells us, without the shedding of blood is no remission. So the difference is that the blood of animals could never take away sins. Okay, all it basically did was just cover them. It only covered them up until the blood of the Lamb could be shed to remove those sins forever. So you and I no longer have to continually offer the blood uh, of animals for forgiveness of sin. Amen. We simply apply the blood of Christ to our sins. We say, well, how do we do that? Answer is found in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. So if the blood of Christ cleansed us from our sin so we could be made acceptable to God in the first place, then it is the same blood that continues to cleanse us from all unrighteousness now. If it, is, if it, if it made us clean, pardon me, if it made us clean, it keeps us clean. So the way to fulfill all unrighteousness and walk in divine protection was not by keeping the law, okay, but by walking in constant fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Let's look at verses 13 and 14. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. 
So let's look at that per first part of that verse, verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Amen. I don't have to say anything else today. Right there. I mean, that's a good place to stop. I'm not stopping right now, but we can rejoice in that. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Amen. Now, it's interesting. The Greek tense used in this sentence indicates that this is a settled action. Okay? Christ has, once and for all, redeemed us from the curse of the law. Goes on to say, being made a curse for us. See, the way that the Lord redeemed us from the curse was to become the curse. Well, you say, well, what does that mean? He became the curse. See, since he was absolute righteousness, he had, he had to actually become sin. Since he was God's health, he had to become sickness. Since he had the riches of heaven, he had to lay aside those riches and become poverty. Why did he do that? Because of us. Because of his great love for us. You know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, Paul tells us, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for, his, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. So for in order, us, for, pardon me, for in order for us to become what Christ is, he had to become what we were. He became a curse that we might become blessed. Hallelujah. He became sick that we might become healthy. He became poor that we might become rich. These are the three categories of the curse of the law. Poverty, sickness, and death, which is spiritual death. And in each of these cases, Jesus Christ became the curse for us so that we might be set free from the curse. Hallelujah. Now let's consider the cause, pardon me, the case of spiritual death. Did Jesus die spiritually for us? Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. You don't have to look there, but you can mark that verse down. And it says, For he, God, has made him, Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. See, so the one who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Hallelujah. We were unrighteous. Jesus Christ was righteous. God made his own son unrighteous so that you and I could be made righteous. Hallelujah. He took our unrighteousness, and we took his righteousness. I mean, and that is referred to, if I don't know if you've heard this expression before, if that is referred to as the great exchange. The great exchange. And it's a blessed great exchange. Amen? Because the Lord, he took upon himself our sinful human nature that we, that we might receive his righteousness, that we might uh, receive his divine nature. He took our sin in exchange for uh, his holiness. Now, if that's so, okay, if by receiving him, we received his nature, we received his holiness, why then, and here's the question on the floor, why then would we ever try to achieve a holiness of our own? Could we ever hope to attain by our weak human efforts what God poured out upon us freely in the person of his own son? I mean, who? Who in their right mind? Hallelujah. Who would be so foolish as to try to, to, to attain a righteousness of his own when, he, when, when he's already freely received the divine righteousness of the very son of God? I mean, don't forget, at the start of the chapter 3 of the book of Galatians, what did Paul refer to the Galatians? He said, oh, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Well, we can see here why he was calling them foolish. Now, that exchange, that's an awesome exchange. I mean, it's wonderful. So, I mean, but for whatever reason, some people have a hard time believing it. That's why they have a hard time receiving it. Because that is precisely the way it is received, by faith. That belief or by belief, which, of course, is faith. I got my little tongue-tied there. That belief is called faith, amen? The righteousness of God in Christ Jesus is received as you would receive any free gift. In fact, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, it says, what does it say? By grace, you're saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So, so the same Paul who wrote those words also wrote in Romans chapter 5, verse 17, that righteousness is a gift. What did we have to give our Lord in exchange for his righteousness? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Okay? If we had to give anything to receive it, then it would not have, be, then it would not have been a free gift. Hello? See, so there was that exchange. 
Christ gave us something, and then he took something in return. But what Christ took from us was not anything that we had to give. He took our sin. He took our sickness. He took our poverty from us and gave us his righteousness. He gave us his health, and he gave us his riches. Now, where does it say that Christ took our sickness? Well, I'm glad you asked. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4 and 5. We read, surely he has borne our griefs. He's carried our sorrows. Yet we did not esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes, what? We are healed. Amen. In fact, Matthew chapter 8, verses 16 and 17, Matthew wrote this to the Lord. When the even was come, they brought to him many who were possessed with devils. And he cast out the spirits with his word, and he healed all that were sick that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. And Peter, he writes in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, he says, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should, be, should live under righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. Amen. So Jesus, he became the curse of sickness for us, that we might be made well. Now, uh, here's an interesting question. Was Jesus ever sick? I mean, we have no record that he, in, in the Word of God that he ever was. I mean, he never knew a day of sickness in his life. And he certainly didn't bring that sickness with him from heaven, because there's nothing up there for him to bring that down. He said that he, said that he came to this earth to do the will of his Father in heaven. And while he was here, he went about doing good. Amen? And healing all that were oppressed of the devil. But when Jesus Christ went to the cross of Calvary, there he took upon himself sickness. He took upon our sickness. He took upon your sickness. He took upon my sickness. Just as he took upon himself all of our sins, that we might receive his wholeness as well as his holiness. He also took our poverty, that we might receive his riches. Jesus Christ became our poverty on the cross. And think about it. He was prosperous when he walked on this earth, just as he was sinless and whole in body and mind. So where did Jesus become sin? Well, of course, we know. We, we realize it was on the cross. When did he become sickness? When did he become poverty? At the cross. Why? Jesus became these things at the cross because it's written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree, not everyone that walketh on the earth, okay? Therefore, if Christ has become a curse for us, that we might become blessed... If he, took it upon, if he himself took upon our sin, he took upon our sickness, he took upon our poverty and our spiritual death, hallelujah, that, that, that we might receive his righteousness, his health, his riches, uh, and, and an eternal and abundant life, then why, 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 if somebody could please answer that question for me, why would we ever strive to get these things for ourselves? All we have to do, all we can do, is receive them freely as a gift from God the Father, Amen who laid our sins on his own son and nailed him to a tree, that you and I might receive his righteousness. That means that if Jesus walked a life free from sin on this earth, then so can you and I. Oh, hallelujah. If he walked free from sickness and disease, so can you and I. If he lived free of poverty, so can you and I. Amen? But you say, well, somebody said, well, you know, Jesus said that he had no place to lay his head. That's right. That's because he was a minister. That does not mean that he was poor. Only that he was, and I'm going to have fun, fun pronouncing this word, itinerant. I hope I pronounced that right, but that basically means he traveled from place to place, okay? Jesus traveled with a company of 12 disciples, plus many others who accompanied him wherever he went. Yet we have no record that they ever went hungry. We have no record that they ever went naked or without shelter because of a lack of provision. Even when he sent out the 70 and commanded them to explicitly not to take anything with them, not even a change of clothes. When they came back later, he asked them, when I sent you without purse, without scrip and shoes, did you lack anything? And they said, what, did they, what was their answer? Nothing. We lack nothing. Luke chapter 22, verse 35. So our Lord was never without means. I mean, for goodness sake, he had a, he had a money bag, which was carried by Judas Iscariot. And it must have been amply filled because we know that Jesus was, or Jesus, pardon me, Judas was skimming off the top of it. He was embezzling from it. 
Jesus gave to the poor. Poor people can't usually don't give to poor people. Okay, I mean, he wore nice clothes. He had to be, I mean, they, they were gambled over by the soldiers who crucified him. Okay, so Jesus was not poor. Not until he went to the cross. There he became poor. That we might be made rich. And I'm sure you realize that, you know, although our, our artists and sculptors, they always represent our Lord on the cross wearing a loincloth. Well, that actually is not historically accurate. When the Romans crucified a person, he was always completely naked. That was part of the shame of the cross, which we sing about in, in many of our, of our old hymns. On Calvary, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was not only stripped of his vestments, he was also stripped of his position, he was stripped of his dignity, his, he was stripped of his holiness, he was stripped of his righteousness, uh, and he was stripped of even that, of that fellowship that he had with his Heavenly Father. I mean, that's why he cried out on the cross, Matthew 27, 46, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was rejected of men, and he was rejected of God. He became sin. He became sickness. He became poverty, all for you and I. I mean, I don't know about you, but aren't you glad that Jesus Christ took that curse? Amen. I know I am. That we might receive the blessing. He did that once and for all. All that is past. When Christ rose from the grave, he did not arise sinful, sick, or poor. Our Lord is no longer sin. Our, our Lord is no longer sickness. Our Lord is no longer poverty because he is no longer dead. He is alive and well and living in glory where all the riches of heaven belong to him. And as 1 John chapter 4, verse 17 says, As he is, so are we in this world. That means that we too are alive and well and living in his glory, beneficiaries of all that is his. Amen? Well, praise the Lord. I trust that you learned something this morning as we've delved into continuing to, into this book of Galatians in chapter 3. Uh, we didn't get a chance to touch on that Abrahamic covenant, but we're going to look at the blessing of Abraham next week and also touch on the Abrahamic covenant. So thank you again for being here today. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Amen.